Joshua 8, verse 34 and verse 35. And it reads, And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessings and cursings according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. Today I want to share with you on the subject, blessings and cursings. Father, I thank you again for the privilege of standing here to declare your word to your people. We thank you for your presence, O oh God. Your presence makes a difference. And I pray that as I share this word with your people, you will take this word and make it a reality to your people that they will hear, they will understand, it will affect their lives. Every listener, let this word impact their lives in no uncertain way in Jesus' name. And the church says, Amen. Before the death of Moses, he did something very important, which is recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 27. In a dramatic way, Moses rehearsed before the children of Israel the blessings and the cursings of the law. And I said he did it in a dramatic way because he made half of the tribes to stand on a mountain called Mount Gerizim and another half to stand on a mountain called Mount Ebal. And uh, the Levites stood in the center and uh, the Levites shouted the blessings of the law and the people responded, Amen. I want you to picture these two mountains, the Levites in the center, half of the tribes on one side, half on the other. And the Levites are declaring the blessings and the cursings. And the people responded by saying, Amen. Those on the mount called Gerizim responded to the blessings. Those on Mount Ebal responded to the cursings. That is why Mount Gerizim was special to the Samaritans. They said, Our Father, worship in this mountain. Because there is where the blessings were spoken from. So they told Jesus, all fathers worship in this mountain, but you Jews worship in Jerusalem. But Jesus said, you worship, you know not what. And it's in, it shows something there, you know, they didn't choose Mount Ebal, they chose Mount Gerizim, because everyone likes the blessing. But both blessings and curses were rehearsed, and the people had to say amen to both. Today, not many would have a problem with saying amen to the blessings. But to say amen to the cursings or the curses, many would have a problem with that. However, when the people said amen to the curses, they were not cursing themselves. They were simply acknowledging that the curses are real and the blessings are also real. They were simply acknowledging that curses and blessings 
are real and put pertaining to the curses, they were acknowledging that this is what will happen to us if we disobey God's word. Whether they said amen or not, what was written will certainly come to pass. By saying amen, they were simply reminding themselves that blessings and curses were a reality because God said so in his word. So Moses did that. And as I said, it was a dramatic thing. He wanted to get the message to them. Think about that. Well, today we are going up to two mountains. For what? We're going to rehearse curses and blessings. And he organized them. And the, the Levites shouted out the curses and the blessings and they said amen. I thought that that is something they would have remembered. I am giving this backdrop to the life of Joshua and the call that God placed on his life. For the time came when Moses died and in Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 the Bible says after the death of Moses the servant of the Lord it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun Moses' assistant saying Moses my servant is dead. So Joshua is now called to be the successor of Moses. He was the man who assisted Moses and now he must succeed him. And God said, now he's dead, arise and go over this Jordan. So Joshua must, must take the people into the promised land. Where Moses did not take them, he must now take them. He said, you and all these people to the land which I am giving to them, to the children of Israel. And I want you to know those words, this Jordan is significant. And I will show you why in a moment. God charged Joshua to keep the words of the law in order to be blessed and successful. Joshua 1 and verse 8. The Lord said to Joshua, as the new leader, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Now I want you to know that included in the book of the law was the command to obey God's voice. Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Now therefore if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people for all the earth is mine. Many years later, Jeremiah reminded Israel of that command. Jeremiah chapter 11 and verse 7. For I earnestly exhorted your fathers in the day that I brought them up out of the land of Egypt until this day, rising early and exhorting, saying, Obey my voice. Now, the significance of this is that although they had the law written, when they came out of Egypt, Exodus 19 and 20, they met with God in an official way, Moses as their leader, and they made a covenant or a contract with God. If, if you will be, bless us, if you will be with us, we will be your people, we will serve you, and God is saying, I will be your God, I will bless you, I will protect you. And God was the one who initiated that, initiated it. And the people agreed 
Moses went up. God said, go down and tell the people, listen, if you worship me, I will do this and that for you. I will be your God. I'll make you the head and not the tail. I'll put you first. You'll not be last. For all the earth is mine. They said, go back and tell God. We said, yes, we agree. God, Moses went up again, told God, yes. Moses came down, but this time he came down with a, with a contract agreement. That is the Ten Commandments in Genesis, Exodus, sorry, chapter 20. If, if this contract is going to hold, this is what you must do. And the people said, Amen. But apart from the Ten Commandments, God also said, at any point I speak, you must obey my voice. And apart from the Ten Commandments, in all, there are 613 laws, stipulations written down. But God also said, obey my voice. And that becomes part of the law because that is also written. But this means that I can, if I say to you, pack up and go and live in the United States, and you know it's me, obey me. If everybody wants to go and I tell you, stay here, obey my voice. You see, he always left room for personal relationship and not just legalistic rules. So God could come into any church and say whatever he wants. Once it is God, we have a right to obey. But what this means is that God has never left us with just rules. He wants us to have a personal relationship to him. And really that's part of the rule. Are you getting it? So now Joshua is going to take Israel into the promised land. And he experienced his first miracle in crossing the Jordan. And it was the most difficult time in the year to cross the Jordan River because at that time the Jordan overflowed its banks. And that made it impassable. So, when you read Joshua chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, For the Jordan River overflowed all its banks during the whole time of the harvest, the latter part of the verse. So when God said to Joshua in Joshua 1 and verse 2, Go over this Jordan. He was telling them, Go over in the most difficult time. Wow. The Jordan River at the point of Gilgal, Jericho, where they were crossing, that was to the bottom of the land of Israel. The opposite end is Dan. That side is Beersheba. You'll hear the prophets talking about from Dan to Beersheba. That point from which they were crossing, after that, after that is the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point in the earth. So which means when the, the waters are coming down from all of Galilee and Mount Hermon and all these places, to flow down there, it's coming down heavy. And it's a, there's a lot of water because this is the harvest time. It is the most difficult time to cross the Jordan River. God said that this is the time I want you to cross. Sometimes God will tell us to do things in the time when it is most convenient to us, but not for him. And we don't obey God based on our convenience or how we see things. So that is significant. So it was naturally impossible to cross Jordan, the Jordan River at that time. To attempt to cross Jordan at that time was like attempting suicide. Yet the Lord told Joshua to cross and he gave him specific instructions on crossing the Jordan River. And Joshua was foolish enough to follow the instructions of God. You know the Bible said, if any man seems to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. 
And if you really want to be a fool, be wise in yourself and don't listen to God. That's the point. The Bible tells us cutting through some stuff. Je Joshua chapter 3, 15 and 16. He told the people all that he wanted them to do. The priests must go in front with the ark. The people behind. Remember, it's over three million people. It says, and they that bear the ark will come unto Jordan. And, and as they that bear the ark was come to Jordan, watch this. And the feet of the priests that bear the ark dipped in the brim of the water. For Jordan overflowed all his banks all the time of the harvest. When the brim of the feet of the priest touched the water, when the feet of the priest touched the brim of the water, verse 16, the waters which came down from above stood and rose up a heap very far at the city Adam. The King James said from, but it really means to that point. The city Adam, that is beside Zerathan. And those that came down toward the sea, meaning the Red Sea of the plain, even the Salt Sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. So from where they were to the Dead Sea would have been several miles. So it means there was a huge gap from which the water flowed off. So it would have been dry now. No water is flowing because everything flowed down into the Red Sea. But from where they stood on the other side, according to biblical scholars, from Jericho back to the city of Adam, the Bible said the water flowed backward and that was about 19 miles. As the feet of the priests touched the water, the water began to back up the water. With the ark, the water saw power. The water had instruction from the Almighty. A miracle took place and for 19 miles, Further than their eyes can see. Without explanation, the water flowed backward. When you obey God, some things will flow backward. When you obey God, miracles will take place. When you obey God, when you walk with God, you activate the supernatural. I want us to understand something. Christianity is a supernatural life. There's nothing about Christianity that is natural. Christianity is supernatural. From your very birth, it is supernatural. So, I could imagine what it was like to see that water go in reverse. And everybody, every single one, all the little children, all the little ducklings coming over, the fowl cackling, and the, everything came over the goat, the cattle, everything. By this, by this time, Joshua might have been feeling so good about himself, and who would not? He would have been on a high, he would have been feeling elated. But God, the Lord, showed up because he had to now go to Jericho to take the city of Jericho. And he had an encounter with Christ in Christophany. What is a Christophany? A Christophany is an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament before he became incarnate in the New Testament. The Lord showed up, and you see this in Joshua chapter 5, 15, 13 through 15. He showed up to teach Joshua an important 
lesson. The Bible said that it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. Notice that. His sword drawn. It wasn't in the sheet. It was drawn in his hand. So he wanted him to, he wanted that to get his attention. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or against us? So he said, no, I am neither for you or against you. I am in a class all by myself. He said, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said, What does my Lord say unto his servant? So Joshua, God was causing Joshua to recognize, Listen, the commander of this thing is I. I am the one who caused the water to flow backward. You are the commander under the commander. And the Bible says, then the commander, when Joshua asked, what does my Lord say unto his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandal from off your foot for the place upon which you stand is holy. So Joshua did so. And so Joshua is now prostrated before the sword man. The last person that did that was Moses. When he saw God in the burning bush. And you don't bow down and worship anybody except it is God. So this was God. A Christophany. Christ's appearance in the Old Testament before he became incarnate in the New Testament. I want you to understand something. The drawn sword in the hand of the Lord, the commander of the army of the Lord, represented his words of instructions to Joshua by which he will defeat his enemies. Quite early, God sought to settle in the mind of Joshua that a sword that will win the battles would not be the one in his hand or the hands of the children of Israel, but a sword in the hand of the Lord which is his word. And as long as they obey the word of the Lord, the sword in their hands will work and be successful. There was a sword behind the sword, and the sword was thus said along. Come on, somebody. God wanted Joshua to know that victory depends on hearing and obeying God's word. In the New Testament, God's word is referred to as a sword. Ephesians 6 and verse 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Hebrews 12 and verse, Hebrews 4 and verse 12, for the word of the Lord is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword. Revelation 19 and verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he's still striking nations today. Listen. God made this clear to, Je to Joshua. It is my word and my word alone I will give you success. If you obey me, if you listen to me, forget about those fellows with their chariots and their sword and their spears. You see, this sword I am holding here, this is my tongue. This is what I created a world with. I destroyed armies with this. This is what I destroyed Pharaoh with, this, my tongue. This, that is represented in this. If you listen to me, not, not a man will be able to stand before you. Not even nature will stop you. So now, Joshua must take Jericho. He, he got the message. And uh, he was given now 
what specific instructions to take Jericho. Listen to this now. None of which made sense in the natural. God's word doesn't have to make sense to us. It is sense whether it makes sense to you. Because God told Joshua, Joshua chapter 6, 1 through 5, this city that seems impregnable, shut up tight and well secure, high walls, this is how you're going to take this city. I want you to get the Levites, those people who are involved in worship, put them in front. Get some priests with some trumpets. And I want you all to march around that place. The Bible says, Joshua 6, chapter 6, from verse 3. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go around the city once. This you shall do six days. The seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times. The priest shall blow the trumpets, and it shall come to pass when they make the last, the long blast with the ram's horn. When you hear the song of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall flat, and the people shall go over every man straight before him. So march for six days. Every day you march once and you go back to your home. But on the seventh day, you march seven times. So that's 13 circles. Could you imagine these people, these people in Jericho seeing these people coming to take their city, but they're marching around for six days? They might have been saying, what, what, what nuts are these? These are idiots. Then Joshua said that to the people also, more instructions. Joshua 6 and verse 10. You shall not shout nor make any noise with your voice. Neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I bid you shout. Then you shall shout. I could imagine if it was some of us Trinidadians who say, don't shout. But some of us Trinidadians and, they, you know, we are seeing the enemy on the wall and they are saying, hey, what do you think all you're doing? And they are throwing words at you. Look at him, he can't march straight. And some of you might have been tempted to say, you stay there, we're coming for you. But Joshua said, don't say a word. If you bounce your toe, don't say, ouch. Because Joshua was giving them the word of the Lord. But that was not all. Look at Joshua chapter 6, 17 to 19. This is the most crucial instruction, one of the most crucial pieces of instructions that Joshua gave, gave to the people. And I don't know if they really took it seriously. And this was what you must do after you are successful. After the wall falls. Hear what he said. Joshua 6, 17 through 19. And the city shall be a curse. Even it and all that is therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house. Because she hid the messengers that were sent. And ye, in any wise, keep yourselves from the accursed thing. Lest you make yourselves accursed. When you take up the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and the gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So these were the instructions. March. Be 
quiet. When the wall falls, don't take anything. Except the gold, the iron, the brass, and so forth must come into the house of the Lord. The reason for this is that Jericho, as the first city they are taking, must be dedicated to the Lord. The word dedicated and a curse in the text in the Hebrew means the same thing. And this is profound because it means whatever is dedicated to the Lord, if you take it, it's a curse. And you becomes a curse. So what is for God? Don't mess with it. Also, the city of Jericho was to be an offering to God. God said, I don't want you to take any clothes, don't take sheep, don't take cow, don't take duck, don't take fowl. Don't take anything, burn everything, destroy everything. Save only Rahab because she had faith and hid the spies. Bring thus and thus, thus and thus into my house. So the whole of Jericho was to be dedicated to the Lord. So they march. Joshua chapter 7 and verse 1, the children of Israel. Joshua 7, 6 and verse 20. So the people shouted and the priest blew the trumpet. And it happened that when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, they, the, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. But something happened. That not many notice. Chapter 7 and verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took up the accursed thing and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. One man took something that God said do not take and the Bible says God got furious. God got hot. His anger boiled. I want you to know there are things that angers God. I want you to know that God as a person gets angry. The Bible says the Lord his anger was kindled not just against Achan but against Israel. Even those who did not know what happened. Even those who were innocent. He was angry with the whole nation. For disobeying his voice. Because one man disobeyed his voice. I want us to understand something. God hates sin. So now. No one knew but God. He was angry and probably they didn't even know. And what he did. He withdrew from them. With all they knowing. And so they. They decided now, okay, we're going to take after Jericho since we crossed the Red Sea and we saw the power of God. We march around Jericho and we saw the power of God. Now we're going to take Ai. So they sent spies to spy out Ai. Joshua sent men to spy Ai. And they came back and said to Joshua, rest yourself. Don't worry. This is easy. There's just a few people there. And we can handle this. We could take AI. Just set up about two to three thousand. And it will be okay. And the Bible tells us in Joshua chapter 7 verse 6 through 12. The Bible tells us. Before I go there. I'm cutting through some things for time's sake. Israel was defeated at AI. 36 men died. That might have 
been 36 widows now and a lot of children that, that are orphans and Joshua was disconcerted discouraged he was deflated When he heard the news, how could that happen? How could we lose? We were in a winning streak. Joshua chapter 7 verse 6 through 9. Then Joshua tore his clothes. I want you to see this. And fell to the earth with his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. So he went into the house of the Lord in the tabernacle where the ark was. He tore his clothes. In those days when you tore your, when you tore your clothes, you mean, I'm really distressed. I'm in trouble. And he took the elders of Israel. And watch this, they put dust on their head. They took dirt and they put dirt on their head. They put dust on their hair. Their heads. So you could you imagine these men now they're looking miserable in the presence of God before the ark. Their, their clothes are thaw, torn and dust on their head, dirt all over them, and they're saying, Look, this is this is how we really feel. We are messed up. And Joshua, the mighty warrior who stood with Moses and heard all the people grumbling and all kind of stuff, and never grumbled but stood faithful. And saw now more miracles than Moses. Verse 7. And Joshua said. Hear what he said. At last. Lord God. Why have you brought this people. Over the Jordan. At all. To deliver us into the hands of the Amorites. To destroy us. Joshua is telling, asking God. Why did you. Allow us to cross the Jordan. To deliver us into the hands of the enemies. To destroy us. Oh that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the Jordan. The man didn't even just ask a question. He said we should have stayed there. Oh Lord. He said what shall we say when Israel turns its back before its enemies. For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth. He said, Lord, because of this new development, the Canaanites will hear it. They will say we are weak. They will surround us and they will cut us off from the earth. We are doomed. But as a smart person now, before God is pleading, Joshua brought God in the mix. He said, then, what will you do for your great name? He said, God, what about your name? What will you do when we are cut off? Joshua 7, 10 through 12. Then the Lord said to Joshua, He's there crying, messed up. At the, the men are hearing him bawling on the ground and saying all these negative words. So the Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why do you lie on your face? Israel had sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. So they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived. And they have also put it among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies saints when we disobey God we cannot stand toe to toe against Satan when we when we disobey God when we are walking in sin and disobedience we cannot stand against the power of Satan we cannot stand against our enemies when sin is in the camp the 
Bible says, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but they turned their backs before their enemies. That is what will happen. Instead of standing up like David and say, you come against me with, with spear and shield, I come against you in the name of the, today you're dead. No, 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 we ain't doing that. We're turning our backs like a little poodle dog and running. Wait, wait, wait. Look the devil there. The Bible said the wicked flee it when no man pursued but the righteous is as bold as a lion. When you are fearful, you'll make plans with the devil. When you are fearful, you'll make plans to go back. When you are fearful, you will not obey God. You will disobey more and give reasons to disobey because you'll say, we can't do this, we can't do that. And they will begin to sell out like some of those kings in the old. They sell out the golden shield and they brought in brass shields and they sell out and water down the religion, water down Christianity. Are you hearing me? Because of fear and compromise. Until the devil destroy you just like Saul. The last thing he did was commit suicide. Why? Because he would not listen to God. He will not obey the word of God. Listen to me. Sin does not end where it begins. It will take you further than you intended to go. Cost you more than you intended to pay. And keep you longer than you intended to stay. And it will end in hell. And listen, if you're sinning and God is troubling you, it's because he loves you. If you're sinning and you're blessed and you're happy, it's because he doesn't reject you. The Bible says the prosperity of fools will destroy them. But whom the Lord loves, he chastises. He chastises. So if you're under chastisement, thank God. But it's better just to serve God faithfully. Amen. Amen. So God said to Joshua, get up. I believe he's saying to some, somebody today, get up. Why are you lying down there? Why are you grumbling? Why are you complaining? Get up. There's a problem. Deal with the problem and I will bless you. He said, Israel has sinned. But listen. He said, therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they are they, watch this, because this, was, this is verse 12, because they have become doomed to destruction. The things that were to be doomed to destruction, dedicated to the Lord, they are cursed things. When they took it, they too became cursed and doomed to destruction. Now, the Lord is about to say something here. And if this doesn't shock you as it shocked me, I don't know. Then, then the Lord said, neither will I be with you anymore. When I read that, I said, what? One man sinned. God told Joshua, this is why you lost the battle. God could have exposed Achan even before 36 men died. Because he would expose it after. He could have exposed it before. He allowed blood to be shed. He allowed men to die. Joshua is now crying before him. Oh God, we finish. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God. So get up. Stand up like a man. Let me tell you what the problem is. If you're going to be a mighty warrior. You're not going to go, just deal with the enemy. You're going to deal with yourself. Deal with sin. Deal with compromise. Listen to me. Obey me. Whether who like it, who don't like it, let them lie alongside it. But obey my voice. Could I preach up in here? All right. I don't want to preach too quick. Listen. That, 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 that shocked me. I said, God, you mean you can say this to us today? Deal with that thing else. Neither will I be with you anymore. Anymore. Yes. God, mean, God means that. But it was Achan who sinned. I want us to see some more stuff here. And God knew it was Achan. Yet God charged the whole nation with sin. We need to understand something today in Christianity. One sin can affect the whole church. The Bible said a little leaven leavens the whole lamp. 
The Bible said, put away from among you the wicked person. Otherwise, if you keep them, you'll become wicked too. If you know that, I said, if you don't know, you don't know. But if you know, deal with it. There must be discipline in the house of God. It's true the Bible says if we, if we confess our sins he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are not in the business of destroying people but part of saving people is disciplining them when they fall and whatsoever is known whatsoever is in the public must be corrected in the public. So if you go outside and you make get pregnant and all these things, you don't come back in church with a belly and then say, we want to dedicate this child in the church and instead of Christian going to the dedication and giving shower, you need to repent. Come on. We're not here to, against you, but you need to expose this thing and it must be dealt with. And there must be no shower. Shower what? Let them go in a corner and cry if you love them. You have to understand the seriousness of sin. We have a lot of people jumping around. People commit fornication, they make child, you're going shower. They commit an adultery, they're going and get remarried to somebody else, you go in the wedding. The Bible said, be not partakers of other men's sin. And the church must be very, very serious when it comes to sin. I'll show you why. You know how God dealt with this? He waited until 36 men died. And then he told Joshua, he said, listen now. God knew who did it. God said, I want you to call all the tribes one by one. Three million people. And I want you to go through every single family of every tribe. Benjamin. Judah. Levi. Issachar. Zebulun. Naphtali. And they're going and they're searching and they're searching. And God knows where this, the man is. Until they found him in the tribe of Judah. Why did God do it that way? He wanted them to know that you must spare no effort to get rid of sin. I hate sin. You must not take sin lightly. Spare no effort to root it out. If you're going to be my people. Anybody in the house? This was to teach the people of God the seriousness of sin and how seriously God takes sin. And Malachi 3 and verse 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Don't think God can change. God or God has changed. God cannot change. So now, this is where I come to the text. After this happened, Joshua said, boy, Moses did something some years ago and I didn't realize the seriousness of that thing. I didn't realize the wisdom of what he did. You know, sometimes as young people, we might criticize our elders and leaders and so forth for certain decisions they, make, they made and so forth. But when you become an elder, then you realize, now I know what it is like. You know, you might criticize the board, but when you sit there, then you realize. So he said, no. Moses did something some years ago on Mount Gerizim and Ebal. He put half of the tribes on Mount Gerizim, half on Ebal. Some priests in the center, they shouted out the curses and the blessings and he made the people say amen. So Joshua said I'm going to do that too. Look at the text again. Joshua chapter 8 verse 34 and 35. Uh, and afterward he read. Afterward that's the very next chapter. After he went through this encounter. It was a life changing encounter. The Bible said and afterward he read all the word of the law. The blessing and the cursing according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses had commanded which Joshua did not read before all the assembly of Israel with the women, the little ones and the strangers who were among them. So Joshua called out the whole nation. Even the children were involved in this and Joshua read out the law 
every word that Moses read out before all the blessings and the cursings because what happened there was that Joshua realized wait a minute God is as is as dread as he is good God is severe and he is good God blesses and God curses you can get blessings from God but you can also get in trouble it was I who came over the jo the Jordan River I saw the water backed up for 19 miles but here I but I know what it is to fall on my face and feel hopeless and to hear a voice from God saying get up if you don't deal with this I will be with you no more are you hearing me and listen to me don't think God is joking in the time of Israel we have to only wonder why the generation of Abraham went down into Egypt for 400 years and after they came out of Egypt why they went into Babylon for 70 years and why 10 tribes disappeared how about 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew how about 2,000 years of silence from Matthew to now at one time God told Moses listen if if step aside I will destroy this whole nation and raise up an next nation out of your lines so God said if you don't deal with this I will no longer be with you that song's harsh. That song's blunt. I mean, he didn't even put a little peanut butter and jelly with some Coca-Cola to smoothen it up. If you don't deal with this, this is where we part. This is the last words you will hear from me. I will no longer be with you. The man who was the man of God. Yeah. The man who was reigning. The miracle worker. God said, listen. That's it. I'm not going to be with you. You're going to be dry. You're going to be ordinary. You're going to be no anointing. Nothing. You wash up. You finish. Pack up and go home. Go back and live an ordinary life. Go and plow the land. How many churches God is not with? But do we care? As long as we're making money and we have lights and we have bling and we have all of that. Who judging sin? Who cares to deal with sin? These are issues that we must look at today because God cannot change. And do you know in the law that Moses read out and Joshua read out 14 times the word bless was mentioned but 32 times the word curse was mentioned. For all those of you who think preaching on hell and reminding you of hell and the curses and so forth is not good preaching. Think again. Jesus spoke more about hell than he spoke about heaven. Not reminding yourself of God's wrath and his judgment does not diminish its reality. If I'm a doctor and you come to me and I, I know you need surgery and you need it urgently and I said take two Panadol and go home because I don't want to hurt your feelings. <laughs> what kind of doctor am I? We need to tell people the truth. So based, you see, God has a sense of humor. God says, oh Joshua, you cause the, 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 the river to go back and all of these things. And Joshua is excited. But God said, I want to teach you a lesson now. And when he experienced that lesson, he said, no, I'm going back to the law. I'm going to read the word for the people. Let them know the truth. Let them realize that blessings and curses are reality. Blessings and curses are real. 
The curses are as real as the blessings are real. Hello. I wonder if anybody is getting it. I wonder how many I should say are getting it. Because we are so blessing driven. It can't happen to me. It would never happen to me. I am lucky. God just loves me and I just have a way of getting through. You know many thought like you and they didn't get through. The road to hell is paved with good intentions and positive mentality. Today in the church, there's a blessing cult. People just want you to tell them they're going to be blessed. But no among them telling you you're going to be blessed when you are hiding the thing like Achan. Going to be blessed. I am just fooling myself. Joshua wasn't the sword man. The sword man was the commander. He said, if you obey my word, if you obey my instruction, even when it does not seem to make sense, even when it seems like you are taking a suicidal step, but you know God said it, learn to obey my voice. If you don't listen to that voice, you are going to perish. You are going to, you're going, you are going to be destroyed. We need to settle in our spirits. That there is a God. He is true. He is real. His word is real. His word is quick and powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. And God cannot lie. He has not lied. He has never lied to one single person. And if he said it is so, if he said it, it must come to pass. God stands with his word. What gives meaning to life is that God means what he says and if God doesn't mean what he says life has no meaning God is, God's word is a reference point to sensibility and reality you know many Christians are backslidden today listen to me let me talk to you straight it's 35 years I, I'm preaching as a pastor Many like you are now chained in the devil's prison. I want to tell you, chain. There are some backsliding when you backslide. You're still saying, Look, Pastor, they Pastor, pray for me. You know, I'm coming, I'm coming. But there's another kind of backsliding where they are convinced they have not backslidden. They're convinced that you are the problem. The church is the problem. And they're living in sin, you know. Shock up. Lesbians, gays, all kind of vile lives. But you are their biggest problem. I mean, they real go on. And that happened consistently for 35 years. And I am certain that there are several people here who are next on the list. I know that's hard to say. But it's the truth. If you don't guard yourself, you'll come under the curse. That is what I came to say. And the people that turn out the worst are some of the people I never thought would. And I don't think anyone thought they would. And that is why we all must gather ourselves. The best thing you can do for yourself is to be hard on yourself when it comes to God. Amen. And don't love yourself more than you love the word of God. Amen. Sometimes you got to say to yourself, behave yourself. Anybody in the house? I want to tell you that God's plan is to bless you. That's the plan. God mentioning curses are not to curse you. It's just to caution you. Hey, don't go there. Anybody that loves you will tell you that. You see this road you are traveling on? There's a precipice ahead. When you see a silk cotton tree next to a ravine and an old tractor, slow down! Have a precipice. Anybody that loves you, no, I'm, I know you're enjoying your ride, you know. You just go brave, something will work out. You lie. There's a precipice ahead. Your joy could suddenly come to a stop and you could be waking up in eternity without any hope of returning. 
This is the truth. This is the reality. If you slide the word of God, for the many of you who can't come out to pray, I can't pray. Let me tell you something. Your strength is not in yourself. You need God. You need God's power. You need strength in the inner man. The Bible said men ought always to pray and not to faith. Are you hearing me? The strength is not in the flesh. The arm of flesh will fail. We need God. And so God will tell us the truth because his ultimate plan is to bless us and to bless us in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came into this world and shed his blood to break the power of Satan and every right of Satan over your life to bless you and make it a head and not the tail and make you a blessing. He wants to bless you to be a blessing. Listen to me hear what the Lord said in Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1 through verse 8. Now it shall come to pass that if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord thy God and carefully observe his commandments which I command you this day that the Lord will set you on high above all nations and all these blessings will come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord. Blessed shall you be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your ground and the increase of your herds and the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. When you make your bread you will be blessed. When you cook your food you will be blessed. Whatever you do you will be blessed. Blessed shall you be. Amen. When you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemy that rise up against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come against you one way and they shall flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command a blessing on you in your on you in your storehouse and into and all that you put your hands to. He will bless you in the land which the Lord is giving you and it goes on and on. But from verse 15 he says, but it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord, your God. To observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today. That all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city. Cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. And he goes on and on. And then the, uh, Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 26 through 32. Let's read verse 26 through 28 behold i said before you today blessings and curses a blessing if you obey the commandment of the lord your god which i command you this day and a curse if you do not obey the commandment of the lord your god but turn aside out of the way which i command you this day you say pastor i hear you but we are in the new testament time are there curses in the new testament well come with me to galatians chapter 1 verse 8 and 9 but even if we or an angel from heaven preach unto you any other gospel than that which we have preached let him be a curse and if the preacher is cursed the people might be under a curse too and uh, if and as we have said to you before i say again if anyone preaches any other gospel than what you have received let him be a curse how many pastors led the church to branhamism how many pastors led the church to all kind of foolishness taking the flock of god and leading them astray the bible said one to the shepherd and lead the flock astray in other words they started as god's people they started under the blessing but end up under a curse there are a lot of churches under a prosperity curse all you're thinking about is money and numbers and people and all of these things what about holiness what about the presence of the Lord what about what about walking with God what about pleasing God what about God being happy and not making people happy listen are there curses in the New Testament? Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be a curse. Paul was saying this to the church. If anyone in the church doesn't love the Lord Jesus Christ, don't play with them. Say, well, you know, you know, we got to understand. I know we got to understand I'm a pastor. But you know, you operate when you are standing between the living and the dead and you are dealing with the souls of people. You think pastor ain't easy? You know what George Whitfield said? He used to preach eight times a day and he preached twice on his wedding day. Many times he preached and went into depression, you know. Why? Because if I come here 
and just give you a nice homily, a nice sermonette to christian it. Who are about to go to hell it? <laughs> I could go home and rest it. But when you have to deal with these issues, Satan comes back at your mind. He comes back at your body. He comes back at your health. A bunch of people in the church praying for you. You go into depression sometimes. Because sometimes you come across uncaring, unloving, insensitive according to man. But if we love people, we must speak the truth. Let them fear and tremble. The Bible says by the fear of God, men depart from evil. I close by reminding you God's plan is not to curse you. you know? All the curses he's talking about is because he cannot change. It's ready to bless you. Is only to bless you. All God is interested in is blessing you, blessing you, blessing you. Listen to me. God wants to bless you beyond your comprehension. Where God has mapped out for some of you, for the rest of your life, you'll be saying, Wow, wow, wow. And every time you say, Wow, in heaven, they will hear, Hallelujah, Hallelujah. Because God is that kind of God. He says, I'll set them up now and make them praise me. You know, even unsafe people, Brother Keon, I saw a man went to a vagrant at the side of the road. A man a spoiled it from his home at the side of the street. He doesn't even have food. He has nowhere to, to sleep. He brought 50,000 US in a box, calling it food. Just to see how he will respond. When the man opened the box, the man couldn't believe and you, you have seen it on social media. People giving away money. Just to see how people respond. Well, let me tell you something. God wants to give you something just to see how you respond. I must say it again. God wants to do something for you. Just to see how you will respond. That he will get a praise. That you will say, no, there is a God in Israel. There is a God in the church. Our God is great. Our God is mighty. But he wants you to fear him. It don't just happen like that. You have to reverence God. God wants to bless you. In Christ. Look at Genesis 12 and verse 3. This is God's plan. God told Abraham. I will bless them that bless you and curse them that curse you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. There's not a family in this congregation here right now listening to me online that God does not want to bless. God don't want no zombie holding you down. He want you to fly free. In Jesus Christ, without respect of person, black or white, rich or poor, in Christ you are blessed. If you could believe it, you are blessed. No obi a man, no obi a woman, no mother corn hawks or corn whatever. Listen to me, with God bless you, you are blessed. You will be the head and not the tail. You will be above and not below. He said that to Abraham and he repeated it in Genesis 22 and verse 18. Give me that. He said that in your seed, notice it's singular, shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because Abraham obeyed him. And then he said to Isaac, Genesis 26 and verse 4. He repeated the same thing. Why is God repeating himself like that? And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And then he said to Jacob, Genesis 28 and verse 4. And to thy seed, I will give thee the blessings of Abraham unto thee, unto thy seed after thee. So he repeated it to, he gave it to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the patriarchs. Now go to Galatians 3 and verse 8.
And the scripture was seeing that God will justify the heathen through faith. Preach before the gospel to Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be what? Blessed. Now give me Galatians 3 and verse 16. This is huge. Unto Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He said not unto seeds. Notice that. It wasn't plural. It was singular. All the time. As of many. But as of one unto thy seed which is Christ. So when God said to Abraham in Genesis 3. 12, 3, 26, 4, 28, 14. When he repeated the same thing to the patriarchs. He was really referring to Jesus Christ. And now because we believe in Jesus Christ and his shed blood and what he has done for us I want you to know you are blessed and God's plan is to take you to a place where there is no sorrow where there is no weeping where there is no crying and that place is heaven he said in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i go to be a place for you and if i go to be a place for you i'll come again and receive you unto myself these are the faithful words of god these words cannot fall to the ground and therefore when you face trial in this world know that god has a plan for you the bible says eyes have not seen nor ears heard neither had it entered into the hearts of men the things that god has provided for them that love him and for them that obey him for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son he was wounded to four transgressions bruised for iniquities that whosoever comes to him whosoever believes on him will not perish but have everlasting life and I want to tell you that God that I just want to bless you when you get to heaven my God I want to tell somebody God has provided a blessing for you now God has provided a blessing for you today the Bible said for now are we the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be like but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him but beloved now are we the sons of God today we are blessed today you are delivered today you are redeemed today you are exalted today you are promoted today there is power inside of you the Holy Ghost is within you the anointing of God is within you the devil's power is broken God has exalted you. God has raised you. God has delivered you. You have power to cast out the devil. Power to pray. Power to bind and loose power over this nation. You got the power. You are redeemed. When the devil looks at you, he sees you shining. You are a child of the living God. When you open your mouth, power comes out. Lift your hands and give him praise. You are dangerous to the devil's kingdom. My God, you are not an accident looking for something to happen. You are a promise. You are a possibility. You are the devil's nightmare. You are blessed. And you're going to be blessed. And the blessing of the Lord will come upon you. And the Lord will shine the Lord will And the blessing of the Lord will overtake you. And I will cause you to lead many. And I will cause you to bless many. And redemption, you shall be blessed. Stand to your feet with me. Ooh. If you know you are blessed, lift your hands and give God a praise. Hallelujah. Come on, if you really believe it, lift your hand with an attitude. Hey! Some of you still lifting your hand casually. Well, praise the Lord. If you are chum my two hands in the air. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. It is not Pastor Gil who said it, it is God. If you are sick, be healed. If you are depressed, be delivered. 
If you don't know where money is coming from, Lord, send some money for somebody today. Work a miracle in the name of Jesus. Make a way where there seems to be no way. We are in your house, and wherever you are, there is liberty. I prophesy to this church. Things are breaking over your life. Light is shining on your path. Mercies are being renewed every day. His loving kindness will be better than life to you. You ain't seen nothing yet. God has some things in store for you. I say, God, who cannot lie. If you would just believe and stay on this path of holiness, see what I will do for you. See what I'll do for your family. See what I'll do for your children. And I know some of you say, but it ain't looking so right now. I was telling the church yesterday, yes, I know that's, it's not looking so. But you know, William J. Seymour, if it wasn't for him, we might not have been speaking in tongues today. But he was a black man blind in one eye and the reason why he was blind is because there was a disease going around at the time his parents were slaves and there was great segregation in the united states he couldn't even enter the bible school to study he had to stay outside and take notes because he was black and here's this man still praying without ceasing and seeking god and seeking god and seeking god and and you know he could have said you know god god don't like me because I can't even go into the Bible school. They won't let me in Charles Fox Parham in a Topeka, Kansas. And upon all of that, now I'm praying and look, I've just lost my sight. I just lost one of my eye. How many of us might have turned back and said, well, you know, God ain't hearing this thing because I done black, I done sleep, I done blah, blah, blah. This or that, now I come and lose my eyesight. But watch this. It was his faith in the midst of the negative thing that brought a blessing to the whole world. A prayer meeting lasted for three and a half years. White people came and got saved. Black people came and got saved. Chinese, Indians, the whole world. A black man. Some of us need to praise God in spite of. If this church is going to be anything, there are some of you under pressure, but God has a plan. Hey! Lift your hands with an attitude and praise God in spite of what the devil throws at you. Because you are blessed in spite of how you feel and in spite of how Satan comes, you are blessed. It's high time somebody rises up and run with a blessing. Those old preachers used to say, one of these days, somebody will take up that same Bible you have and read it and believe it. Think about that. Some old vagrant might just come back to himself and say, let me read this thing. <laughs> if you're here and you're not saved, I want to pray for you if you're not saved and you want Jesus. You're not born again. Lift your hand. I want to see them pray for you. Is there anyone? Slip it up quickly. I want to see them pray for you. Is there anyone? Lift your hand. You're not saved. You're not saved. Are you saved? You. You want to be saved? He's coming. Anybody else? I have to do like Prescott today. I mean, I'm learning something. The apple don't fall far from the tree. If you're saved, you're baptized, you're sure you are saved, sit down. If you're not saved, don't sit down. If you couldn't sit down, come. Anybody standing? Well, everybody sat down. Probably I didn't say it like Prescott. <laughs> Son, thank you for coming. Amen. Give him a round of applause. Jesus loves you. How old? 14. The best decision you could make is to serve God. I'm not saying this to scare you, but just yesterday a young man was here while we were praying and he said his friend, 14 years, while he was 12, got 16 shots 
And he said, up to now, it's affecting him. So you see, young people like yourself are targeted. The best thing to do is to serve God. Say this prayer with me. Bow your head and close your eyes. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe you love me. You shed your blood for me. You died on the cross for me. Jesus, I'm sorry for my sins. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart. Save my soul. Make me a brand new person. Give me your spirit to abide in me. Make me a Christian. Make me a child of God. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing this prayer. Amen. Just put your hands over him. In Jesus' name, I pray for this young man. I pray that your power will touch him. He will never be the same again. In Jesus' name, amen. Follow this young man. If anyone needs prayer, we come here one Sunday uh, for the week and we don't know what people are going through. You heard the word and you need prayer, just come. Everyone stand. Come forward if you need prayer. If you, you just want to come to the altar, I don't know. It's always open.